evening and welcome to our, our midweek service, our Wednesday around the world that we call it. Uh, we've been interviewing missionaries now for the past uh, many months, and today we have uh, one of our missionaries uh, to Chile, and uh, Jason Holt with us. is so good, uh, so glad to be, um, so glad that you're a part of our service tonight. Well, I'm very glad to be a part of the service and to be with you all again. We appreciate you and your church. Yeah, you were here now, uh, was it? It was 2000, was it 19 that you were with us? It was. I think it was in September, maybe October 2019. Okay, right before every all the craziness happened. So, <laughs> well, I'm glad that it's good to uh, be back with you um, via via live stream or via uh, Zoom. We uh, had a few questions that uh, we wanted to ask you. Um, each Wednesday we get together and then uh, we'll ask our missionaries questions. And there's a few questions that we have specifically uh, for you uh, if, uh, if we can uh, ask you this evening. So first question is this, uh, why do you think that God called you to the field specifically that you're in? Now, before you answer that, if you can kind of give a little bit of insight where you guys serve, you and Lori serve, as well as, um, and then if you can follow up then with that, uh, that question. Okay, great. We're serving in the country of Chile, in the city of Santiago, the capital city. We've been here since 2005. And I remember back when I was in high school, I was raised in a pastor's home and really felt like God was leading me toward the ministry. It wasn't really sure where God would have me to go, but knowing that 95% of the world is outside of the U.S. and knowing that God loves the world and wants the world to be reached with the gospel— as a teenager, I thought, well, there's probably a 95% chance that God's going to lead me outside of the U.S. And between my senior year in high school and my freshman year at Bible College, I went on a missions trip to Central America. And it was there that God began to give me a heart for Latin America. And I had an opportunity while in college to do an internship in South America. And the Lord just used step by step of surrendering to ministry and then to Latin America, then thinking about South America, begin to pray about several different countries and study those, contact missionaries, see about needs. And of course, there's a need everywhere. Sure. The Lord put the country of, of Chile in our heart and the capital city, 7 million people. And there's so wow. many areas of the city that still need Bible preaching churches. Uh, really, we're just getting started on the work here. Yeah, it's exciting all that you guys are doing, but you would say you would attest to the first kind of God leading and directing would be through uh, this area of, of uh, this this trip that you went on, missions trip. Would you say that's kind of where as far as the guiding kind of narrowing down was through that that specific uh, trip? A hundred percent. I think a missions trip, not just for teenagers, but especially for young people, is such an important thing to change mm -hmm. your perspective, to give you a, a heart for the world for need. And, and I really think that that's a pivotal moment in my life and many young yeah. people that are taking missions trips. Yeah, for sure. So got to know what is the most, one of the most heart touching things that you've seen as a missionary. When we think about missionaries, sometimes we think about, you know, uh, a child kind of filtering through, uh, through items to find out what they may eat or what their, where their next meal is going to be. But as a missionary, where would you say that would be the most heart touching thing? You know, we're living in a large city. If you walk out of the doors of any of our churches here in Santiago, within just about a 15 minute walk in each direction, there's about 50,000 people living and you've got lar large buildings and concrete and asphalt, buses passing by, subways. And so there's not as much in, in our city of the extreme poverty, but there is on the spiritual side. And I don't know how many times we've had the opportunity, and I'm sure like many of you, um, speaking with someone and, and sharing the gospel with them, and then they look at you and say, I've never seen this, or this is the first time someone's taken the time to share this with me. Yeah, and I remember early on in our ministry, uh, one of those stories that, that sticks out uh, is a guy named Roberto, and Roberto came to the first church that we started and Roberto at the time was married and had two young children. Uh, Roberto was very, very intrigued about the gospel. And he had been raised uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, like most people here in Chile. Uh, yeah. so the church as an altar boy, was preparing to be a priest, but felt a void inside. And he knew that 
all the things that he was trying to do for God and different pilgrimages and things like that, that none of that was filling that void. I met Roberto. We were studying the Bible together. Um, he met Jesus and God changed his life completely. And it was exciting to see him start to grow. But the neat thing is, here we are 16 years after I met Roberto for the first time. And his son now is in the Bible college preparing oh, for wow. here in Chile. And yeah. to see, you know, these multiple generations of, of uh, people that are serving the Lord and now their children that want to be in the ministry. That's just an exciting thing for us. So you. Roberto, um, one of the two kids that he has was was the son who's now in the Bible college. Is that right. accurate? Oh, wow. That is so cool. And that's, right. a, that's a testimony of obviously your guys' um, uh, perseverance, uh, grit, determination, uh, also a great God we serve, but uh, also um, with the partnership that we have with you, that is, that is fruit on the account that we have with you as a result of, uh, of praying and giving, which we're very thankful for. Love hearing stories like that. So if you're, if somebody's interested in becoming a missionary, I, I can't help but think there's probably people that um, that's watching tonight that God may be kind of stirring in their heart to become a missionary. Um, what are some ways that you could encourage them uh, to be interested or maybe even becoming a missionary themselves? Well, I think one of the best things you could do as a first step is take a missions trip. Get involved in maybe the local church is organizing something or some of the missionaries, the church church supports going to the field, seeing the field, being a part of what's going on there on the mission field, even for a few days can be something yeah. that God could use to, to confirm his direction, his will there for your life. But even before maybe going on a missions trip, if you start praying for the world, praying for different countries on a daily basis, praying for the missionaries, reading their updates and their letters, uh, writing, following them on social media so that you can see about the opportunities and needs that are there on the mission field. Just today, I sat across the table there at my office at the Bible College and spoke with a young, a young man named Josue. And Josue and, and I were, were talking about a plan, Lord willing, in the next four or five months. He might be moving to southern Chile about 20 hours away uh, by vehicle to a city called Castro to, to work there in a church plant. And he's a bit fearful about, you know, stepping out. He's got a young family. Uh, their first daughter was born just about a year ago. Uh, but he's finishing up the Bible wow. college here in December, and he's ready to go, ready to step out by faith. But being on the mission field, seeing cities like Castro that need a Bible preaching church, meeting young men like Josue, and realizing that missionaries are just everyday people. They're yeah. not, we're, we're not special or unusual. Just God led us and we stepped out by faith. And the same God that did the work in my heart and did the work, is doing the work right now in Josue's heart, very likely could be working in your heart about being more involved in your local church and your community, or maybe going somewhere around the world and taking the gospel to people that, that have never heard. And so I would encourage you to be open I would encourage you by faith to lean into it and say, Lord, here am I. Send me if that be your will. Yeah, I love hearing stories like that. Um, uh, Roberto, um, the story of him and how his, him just giving his heart and life to Christ and accepting him. And now his sons, I, it makes me think of that verse. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And what a joy it is to be able to see people make decisions, to see people. And you want that uh, you want to see them flourish in their, their Christian walk. And so you'd mentioned a, a thing as far as maybe starting off praying for missionaries, maybe one of our, um, maybe um, folks in our congregation, they're like, I'm going to start taking that step. First step, I'm going to start praying. What are maybe two prayer requests that we can pray for you and Lori about maybe your family specifically uh, in this idea of prayer? Well, there's two things that come to mind. Uh, Josue, the guy I just told you about that, Lord willing, in the next few months, we'll be making a transition to plant a church. Harvest Baptist is the name that he's picked okay. out. He really wants to, to uh, launch that church. So be praying that the Lord would lead. There's a lot of details that are involved between now and then. 
And so I would really like to ask you to pray about that situation. Also, there's another church, uh, Iglesia Bautista Gracia, Grace Baptist Church. And there's an opportunity there, a uh, church that was, was founded by another missionary who currently doesn't have a pastor. And we're praying about the opportunity of being able to, to help out there. So this weekend, actually, I'll be meeting with some guys and all right, here we have an opportunity, a church that needs, needs a pastor, and um, we're praying the Lord will, will give us guidance. And so yeah. that would be something that you all could pray with us about here very soon. For sure. We'll, we'll definitely pray with you. We, I got to tell you, we are so thankful to be able to support uh, you guys. You, we have supported um, um, you and, and Lori for, has it been, I know it's been longer since I've been here at the, at the church. Do you know how long it's been specifically, not to put you too much on the spot? You all took us on for support in October or November of 2002. And yeah. we're really thankful for you all, not just for your support, which has been a huge blessing, but your prayers. Many of you have been in contact with us and followed the ministry and, and all the things that God has done here in Chile's because churches like your church have partnered with us to make the ministry possible. And we know that we're not in this alone. We're in this together, and we thank you for all you've done for the ministry here. Well, we're so privileged to be able to partner with you guys and uh, looking forward to seeing how God's going to work over the next 20 years. And uh, we're so privileged to be able to uh, to work alongside you, but uh, but pray with you and then also uh, to give to support the work there in Chile. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it, and uh, we're glad to be a part of your lives. to be able to hear uh, one of our missionaries, a Holt family in Chile. And I thank you, Father, that we can lift them up to you, the work that they're doing in Chile, and that you would just keep increasing and growing that ministry. Thank you and how you've worked through that family through all these years. Father, and we're thankful that we had a part in that. And all the, the souls that have been saved, lives changed, Father, and we're thankful for that. And we pray that you will just keep that growing. And Father, specifically, they have two requests. We pray, Father, for Josue, who's starting a, uh, a church on the other side of Chile uh, called Harvest Baptist. And I pray for that church. I pray, Father, as it starts off, Father, that it would start strong. You meet the needs financially, spiritually. Uh, remove any red tape that would uh, cause some friction or anything that would cause it from not opening. And I pray, Father, that we would just see great works happening there uh, through Josue. And I pray you keep him uh, protected by Satan from him and from that ministry. Then Grace Baptist, Father, that needs a pastor and an opportunity for a young man to step up. And I pray that the Holtz would find someone and that uh, the right person that would lead that ministry. And again, that you do a great work there. We're so thankful, Father, that we can partner up with these missionaries and we just lift them up to you. We love you and we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's all stand. We're going to sing a song, an old favorite of Pastor. Since the Savior found me, and then we will take up an offering. Since the Savior found me, pardon all my sins. I have had the joy and living hope within. Gone is all the shame and sorrow of the past. There underneath the precious blood of Christ at last. Say, say, saved, I'm happy on the way. Say, say, saved, I love him more each day. Say, say, saved, I know he's mine each hour. He saved and keeps me, sanctified me by his power. Since the Savior found me, all to him I owe. For his precious blood has washed me white as snow. Now no condemnation, happy as can be. I'm glad that Jesus justifies and sets me free. Say, say, saved, I'm happy on the way. Say, say, saved, I love him more each day. Say, say, saved, I know he's mine each hour. He saved me. Keeps me, sanctifies me by his power. Amen. As the ushers make their way down, we're going to pray for the offering this evening. Father, we thank you again for all that you do. Thank you, Father, for meeting our needs. Thank you for the blessings you have shown each one of us. 
We pray, Father, that you meet the needs of this ministry. Thank you, Father, and how you've provided. And I pray, Father, that you'd bless those that give. We love you and thank you for all that you do. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. What a beautiful pianist, my daughter Faith. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Philippians chapter 3. I'll make sure you have your notes out. When I was 13 years old, because of my um, actions and attitude, my mom asked me to move out of my house and move into my sister's house where I would have some control from my brother-in-law. By the way, Gina Finnis, I was looking for you. I have a coat over here for you. Remember, you said you'd bring me the coat and you'd fix it? Okay, good. When, when will you get it fixed? I, mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, but, but I'd like to wear it tomorrow if I could. No, I'm just kidding. Gina is an amazing seamstress. She does amazing things with quilts and amazing things with a lot of things. And she came up to me one day and she said, you have a spot on your collar. I said, it's not a spot, it's an old coat and it's all worn out. And she said, I can fix that. So we'll see. Thank you. I said I can Thank you. That was the truth. She said she'll fix it or she'll ruin it. And so, thank you. At least I know ahead of time. And you did tell me that. That's correct. Anyway, I was 13 years old. My my uh, my uh, I, I was getting a little bit rowdy. I was in the seventh grade, and my my wife, my mother, and my oldest sister. Uh, by the way, Rob, good to see you too. I really want to know what happened yesterday. So after church, don't let me leave because I've been wondering all day long. And your wife texted me about something else today and I thought, why didn't she tell me about Rob? So Rob's like, he's in trouble. He's always in trouble. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, I want to know what's going on with that. Isn't it great to be in the family of God, isn't it? it great to be able to enjoy one another. Anyway, I was 13 years old. I got kicked out of my family. And uh, <laughs> My mo- actually, my mother gently asked me if I if and asked my older sister if uh, they'd be willing to have me move in with them, and so my my so my brother-in-law could have a sort of a, a strong hand over me. And uh, because of that, Las Vegas was much smaller. She lived on the edge of Las Vegas towards Sunrise Mountain. Used to be way back when the last street. Uh, heading out on Lake Mead Boulevard towards Sunrise Mountain was a street called Lynn Lane. Now, it's still there, but it's, it's like in the middle of the city now. But uh, Lynn Lane was the last uh, road, uh, road out there, and my sister lived on Lynn Lane, and she had a couple of horses. And, uh, and so we would, uh, we, would, um, uh, we would 
it was great. Uh, out there, it was an acre. You either had an acre or an acre and a half of property. And, uh, and that acre of property, you normally would have your front yard looking nice. And the, you'd have a little area for your backyard. But in back of that place, you'd have, you'd have horses. And we had horses. And we had chickens. And we had ducks. And we had other things. Uh, back there, and uh, so my responsibility was to take care of the horses and the chickens and that kind of thing. Uh, so, and, and so we had a, a, an acre of property. Now, she had this acre here, and then right next to her, there was a man who, uh, his name was John Mallory. He had a very nice house and very, he had horses, and we would have uh, fun uh, just, anyway, John Mallory was there. Then right next to John Mallory was a man that I never met. Now, he, unlike everybody else, everybody else had ranch-style uh, fences around their, their place. It was like wooden fences. This guy had a brick wall in the back, from his backyard that went all alongside of John Mallory's house. And then there was an acre of property back there. And I was wondering what was back there. And me and my best friend, Billy Johnson, one time decided we would go and we would look back there and see what was back there. Boy, it was amazing. This place was like the Garden of Eden. Beautiful bushes, beautiful trees. Uh, the, the, the lawn was like manicured. It looked like a golf course. It was just gorgeous. It had a big sign out in front of the, uh, of the place. Uh, the gates do not trespass, no trespassing. And, of course, me and Billy were very cautious not to be caught violating the law. And so uh, we... Uh, we, we were looking over there, and they, he had two beautiful, beautiful collie dogs. And out in front of the gate, in, in, in front, as it came to the front yard, there was two big signs. And those signs said, beware. Beware of dogs. And we thought, oh, I guess we're, not, we're supposed to be aware. But we got up on the fence, and we looked down, and Billy said, they don't look dangerous to me. I said, they don't look dangerous to me. He said, you don't think so? I said, no. He said, I, I don't think so. I said, so why don't you go down and see if they'll <laughs> bite you? So Billy was like a daredevil type of guy, and Billy said, I don't think they'll bite me. And he started reaching over and talking to him, and then he jumped down inside. Now he's in this beautiful garden place that we're not supposed to be in, and these dogs, he starts playing with the dogs. I thought, well, if he's okay with them, I'll jump down there too. So we're jumped down there, and we're in the backyard where we're not supposed to be in. We're playing with these dogs, and we're just having a good time, and they're just really wonderful dogs. But outside, remember, there's a sign that said, beware of dogs. And, uh, and, and so I'm, we're thinking, why would he say beware of dogs? Well, number one, he didn't want two 13-year-old punks in his backyard messing around with his dogs. But number two, there was a reason. Because as long as we were there, everything was fine. But then, as we went to jump over the fence to go back, those dogs must have been trained to get anybody on the fence. Because, man, as soon as we went back, they were nipping at our legs. And, and uh, I think they got Billy. Uh, but I was a little faster than Billy. And, uh, but the, the sign said... What we're going to talk about tonight, and that is point number, point number seven in your outline, beware of dogs. Beware of dogs. And that's what, that's what, um, that's where we're going to begin. We've got four more things that God says uh, to beware of. We've looked at already six different things God says to beware of. Tonight we're going to look at the, uh, uh, we're going to look at this Beware of dogs. Now, we'll see how far we get, but this is really particular. Why in the world does God say, beware of dogs? In Philippians chapter uh, 3 and verse 2, the Bible says this, beware of dogs. <laughs> finally, in verse 1, it says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write so the, the same things to you. To me is not grievous, but it is safe, but for you it is safe. And then he says, beware of dogs. I want to write something to you that'll be that'll help you be safe. I'm going to write something to you that'll that um, that some will think uh, I'm I'm being critical, but I'm not. He says, "Look, beware of dogs." In fact, he tells us in this one verse there are three things that we need to beware of. He says, first of all, beware of dogs," and then he says, "Number two, beware of evil workers," and then he says, "Number three, beware of the concision." Father, I pray as we look at these. Uh, 
this, these three things t- tonight particularly, that we would know what it means and that we would take your caution and we would beware of these things that can be harmful to us. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Beware of dogs. I tell people there's, this is evidence that the Apostle Paul went door knocking uh, because he had, to be, he had to teach us to beware of dogs. I, I, people say to me, listen, I'm going out door knocking. I'm, you, you, what are we supposed to do if there's a dog? Stay away from the dog. If there's a sign that says beware of dog, do that. Um, I, never knock, I never venture in. If there's a gate and, it's, and, and if it's even semi-locked, even if it's not locked, if there's a gate and there's a door 20 feet in front of me, if there's a gate, I'm not going through the gate. Why? Because I beware of dogs. I want to be careful. I'm not going to take a chance of getting bit. You say, what if you can see everything in the front yard? You still can't see anything in the backyard. And something could come around that corner at any time. You know, it's not, it's not the dogs that are yapping all the time, yip, 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 that are the dangerous ones. It's that one that sits back and waits. And just looks at you. And he's, it's like he's sizing up the meat. What, what, what part am I going to eat tonight, you know? Uh, the, uh, th- there's a caution. God says beware of dogs. But what is he talking about really when he's saying beware of dogs? The idea of beware of dogs, dogs denotes Gentile believers uh, or Gentile unbelievers that refuse the truth. You know, there are some people who just do not want to hear what you have to say. There are some people who just are going to reject your truth. Now, the fact of the matter is, that's not the case everywhere. I was, um, uh, this afternoon, Pastor Matt and I, and Luke went over to the bank. I needed to sign uh, for a notary of of public, and and I went over there to, to sign. On the way back... Um, Matt said, Luke, what do you want to do? He said, let's get ice cream. And I always think that's a great idea. And so, uh, so uh, he said, uh, he said we, we were driving down the road. We pulled into a Wendy's where we could get uh, Frosty. And we pulled around and, and uh, got Luke a Frosty, handed it to him. I always like to get stuff from my grandkids that when, I, when they eat it, it'll wire them. And then they go home with their parents. And uh, so, uh, but, so I got, I got the... Um, the Frosty handed it back to him. And on, as we were going through, there were two window, win, windows. You know, the lady come out and she said, ah, here's, uh, here's how much it's going to cost. And I, I gave her the thing and I said, hey, let me give you something really good. She said, what's this? I said, this will tell you how you can know you're going to heaven. I said, I wrote this. You'll like this. She said, oh, thank you. And uh, she said, I'll read that. And so she put it uh, in her pocket or whatever. And then I, I, we went to the next window and a uh, lady came, gave us the Frosty, and, I, and she, gave me, uh, uh, she gave me the Frosty, and I, I put it, handed it to him, and she started to turn around. I said, no, wait, 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 I got something for you. And she said, what's that? I said, it's something I wrote. You're going to like this. And uh, she said, well, thank you. And she looked at it. As we were driving away, I said, you know, if you're nice to people, they'll be nice to you. No, typically, people that you're nice to are going to be nice to you. Luke in the back seat said, said, yeah, yeah, we went up to a window one time, and Dad handed the lady a gospel track. I said, oh, that's good. She said, yeah. He said, yeah. She said, thank you. And she laughed, and she tore it up right in our presence. I said, what a great experience. Uh, uh, sometimes people are just mean and nasty, and people don't want to hear what you have to say. They're not interested in the truth that you're giving them. And by the way, you shouldn't not give out gospel tracts because there may be one or two jerks out there. The, the, the reality of jerks in this world is just, is, it's just reality. Sometimes you look in the mirror and you're seeing one. Uh, there, there, there are people that are, have a bad day. There are people that are just nasty. There are people that are unkind. But we're to, to represent Jesus Christ no matter what we do and no matter, no matter how people treat us. The, the fact of the matter is there are those Gentile unbelievers who are going to re, refuse truth. I, I, when I think of this, when he says beware of dogs, I think of that statement that Jesus made when Jesus said, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. He knew there were dogs out there. He knew there were people that were going to nip at your heel. He knew there were going to be people who were going to bite your throat. He knew there were people that were going to be out 
and to get you. There are, uh, see, those that knowingly reject the truth, and they're vicious. People, the, the idea of these dogs are people who knowingly resist the truth. And, because, and as they do, that's the next slide, they're vicious. They're vicious. They, they know what is right, and because they've rejected the truth, they don't want anyone to hear it, and they don't want to hear it from you. So people, every, every summer we have summer missionaries come here, and one of the things that we teach them is this. If you're out knocking on doors, and you start to talk to somebody, and they reject the truth, just, just let, reject them. let them reject it and walk away. I had a, 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 a Jehovah Witness came up to me, and I was at a McDonald's years ago, and a Jehovah Witness came up to me, and he said, uh, he said hey, uh, he started talking to me, and I said, hey, let me tell you something. I don't really believe what you believe, and you don't believe what I believe. I said, I believe I'm going to heaven. I believe I'm putting my faith and trust, in, because I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my God, that I'm going to go to heaven. He said, I know that, uh, he said, oh, you're one of those. And he said, well, let me tell you what I believe. And I said, okay, here's the deal. I want you to take the next five minutes, and I will keep my mouth totally and completely shut. I won't say a thing. You tell me whatever you want to tell me for five minutes, but... If you do that, if I do that, you've got to give me the same courtesy. You go first, then for the next five minutes, I'm going to tell you what I believe. Uh, and he said, he said, well, uh, okay. I said, okay, let's do that. So he, we stood there right outside of this McDonald's, and um, he started telling me everything he believed. And I just kept watching my watch. And he told me, he told me uh, what he believed that, that there was only one God, and his name was Jehovah, and there was no such thing as the Trinity, and they didn't believe in hell, and, and uh, uh, nobody was going to go to hell, and a loving God wouldn't send people to hell. And, and uh, he, he just went on and on, and, and that, that the only way you can get to heaven is by doing good works, and he went on and on. And I listened to him, and he, he did pretty good in five minutes. He's a pretty good salesman, uh, and he, he, he laid this stuff out. And I said, uh, I, I said, great. I said, five minutes is up. I said, now I have my five minutes. He said, uh, okay. I said, now you're going to listen to me. You're not going to argue with me. You're just going to listen to me, right? He said, yeah. And I said, well, okay. I said, now I want to tell you what you don't believe. He said, what? I said, well, you, you, you say you don't believe what I believe, so I want to make, I make sure you know what you, don't, what you don't believe. I said, first of all, you need to understand that, I, that we believe that the Bible's the word of God. So, so do we. I said, well, that's great. So then we're in agreement on one thing, that the Bible's the word of God. I said, number two, Jesus is the God of the Bible. Oh, we don't believe that. I said, wait, 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 wait. You're not allowed to talk. <laughs> I said, you, you've, ta you've told me. And I'm going to tell you what you don't believe. I, you don't believe that what we believe, and that is that we believe that Jesus Christ is God. And we believe that we're all sinners. Well, we believe that. I said, yeah, we're all sinners. And we believe that because we're sinners, we all deserve to go to hell. We don't believe that. I said, I, don't, I, don't, I understand. You don't believe that. I'm telling you what you don't believe. So, so, so you understand that. And uh, he sat there and listened to me. And I said, now the Bible says that because we're sinners, all of us deserve to go to hell, but that Jesus Christ, as God, died and paid the penalty of our sin. He was buried. Three days later, he rose from the dead, was seen by hundreds of eyewitnesses, and that the only way we can get to heaven is by calling on him and asking him to save us. And, that, and I believe that the only way that we can get to heaven isn't by doing good works or getting baptized or doing any of that. The only way we can get to heaven is by coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell. I know you died in my place. I know you were buried and rose from the dead for me. And I want to ask you to save me. That's the only way we can get to heaven. That's what I believe. And I know it's not what you believe, but that's what I believe. I said, so great. Thank you for sharing with me what you believe. Now you know what you don't believe, and we're done. He said, that's it? I said, that's it. He said, uh, he said Do, don't, don't you want to? I said, no, there's no reason for us to talk. I now know what you believe. You now know what you don't believe, and I know what I believe, and so there's no reason for us to talk. And he walked away. He said, well, wait a minute. Did, did, what good did that do? Listen, it's not my ability to persuade somebody to get saved that's going to save them. I'm just supposed to proclaim the truth. And if they'll let me proclaim the truth, then I can proclaim the truth. God, the Holy Spirit, can take the truth that I gave him and just and, and, and bombard him with it all day long and all night long and for the next weeks or years. I, I don't know if I'll see the guy in heaven. But my point is this. I don't need to fight with a dog. 
You fight with a dog, you may wind up getting bit. Uh, you, you, somebody told me years ago, a man said, you don't fight a skunk by beating him to death with a stick. It never works. <laughs> it never works. And so what, what God is telling us here is very simply, you need to beware of dogs. You need to understand there are people who are going to waste your time. I've had summer missionaries come back and say, listen, Pastor, I was out and I was, uh, I was uh, knocking on a door and for... Th- and they were supposed to be out, and they were supposed to have a quota of getting, getting back and have knocked on 100 doors in a couple of hours. So they, they had that, and they came back. Oh, we only got to three doors. Why? Because I was with this one guy, and we were arguing, like, for two and three hours. That's just a waste of your time. These are dogs. These are people who don't want to hear the truth. You say, you're calling people dogs. No, God calls them dogs. I'm just quoting God. These are people who don't want to hear the truth. They, they're vicious. They're going to attack you. Now, there's times that you'll have an opportunity to talk to somebody. I was out knocking on a door one time with my wife and I when our church first started. And we were knocking on this door, and a guy opened the door. And I said, hi, my name is Dave Tyson. This is my wife, Anna. And we're starting a church called Liberty Baptist Church. And we'd like to invite you. And he said, oh, <laughs> you don't want to talk to me. I'm an atheist. I said, oh, no, you're not an atheist. He said, yeah, I'm an atheist. I said, you mean you don't, you're saying you don't believe in God? He said, he said yeah. I said, oh, no, you, it, that's not true. He said, why would you say that? I said, the Bible says this. The fool has said in his heart there is no God. And I said, you're in too intelligent to be an atheist. I said, obviously, the conversation we're having, it's obvious you're too intelligent to be an atheist. What, you're, what you mean is you're an agnostic. He said, what's that? I said, that's somebody who says they don't, that, that uh, they don't understand God, and so since they can't comprehend him, uh, they, 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 they're not denying that he exists. They're just saying, we, I don't understand him. He said, yeah, that's what I am. I said, so you're an agnostic, yeah? You're saying you don't understand God, right? Right, that's what I'm saying. I said, okay, good. I'm here to explain God to you. <laughs> now, we didn't get very far with the conversation, but we did have an, we did have an opportunity. He, he got to see somebody that was friendly and that was coming in the name of Christ. And it's important that we be kind to people and that we always show them kindness. But you need to understand, normally if people are vicious, if they are, if they are dogs, uh, it's because somehow in their past they got burned by some religious guy, somebody who claimed to be a Christian. Uh, it may have been mom and dad, it may have been uncles and aunts, it may be hypocrisy that they saw in somebody else's life, and, because, and they got burned by that, and so, and, and so they tried to be a Christian, but they couldn't do it, and now they're angry at Christians because of what a Christian has done. And so you can't do anything to change them except reflect to them kindness and graciousness when they are unkind to you. You can reflect the love of Christ by being kind to those who are unkind to you. But Jesus says here, you, you need to understand, don't waste your time. Don't, uh, don't uh, get in a situation where someone can bite and devour you. Uh, when witnessing, don't argue with those people who do not want to, to hear. If they're going to tear up the track, don't feel bad about them. Uh, I said to Luke today, I said, Luke's, when Luke told me that story, I said, Luke, you need to understand that one day that person who tore up that track will stand in front of Jesus Christ. And the fact that you gave them that gospel track will mean a whole lot. You gave them an opportunity to be saved. You gave them an opportunity to go to heaven, and they refused it. And that's so, so important that we understand if somebody chooses to go to hell, you can't make them go to heaven, but you can warn them and say, hey, there is a real place. There's a real place called hell. So beware of dogs. Then the second warning is this. It's the same verse. He says, beware of evil workers. Beware of evil workers. This admonition is repeated over and over and over in Scripture. The idea of of an evil worker is somebody who chooses to do wrong and then they try to, to include you with them. Someone who does evil to someone else, remember this, will do the same to you. Someone who does evil to someone else will do the same 
to you. If they stole from other people, they'll steal from you. If they gossip about others, remember this, they'll gossip about you. Man, I learned that so early in, in our ministry. Somebody comes to you and they're going to talk bad about somebody else. Understand this. And boy, there's something about our flesh that just wants to hear it. Oh, did you hear what? No, what, what, what? Did you hear? It could be about anybody. What, what, Ooh, why, why, why? We just are so anxious to hear the negative about somebody else or just hear anything about somebody else. Some, or not Sumner Wimp, but Jerry Falwell used to say this. He used to say that, that the great minds talk about concept, concepts and ideas and goals. He would say then weak minds talk about people. And we need to understand that. We don't, we, now, if we're talking about somebody because we care about them and we're trying to help them, help them, that's one thing. But man, it's so easy to hear and be involved in that which is negative. Let me, let me, uh, let me say this. If, if they will take advantage of others, they'll take advantage of you. Oh, look at this. Look what, look what I got. I, you know. They took advantage of others. I want to read to you something from Proverbs chapter 1. Go, turn to Proverbs chapter 1 if you have your Bible. Solomon, in Proverbs chapter 1 through 10, is, is writing specific um, Proverbs for his son, who he knows is going to take over his throne. And he wants his son to be a successful king, he doesn't want him to be a failure as a king. And so he writes to him all these admonitions, all the way from Proverbs chapter 1 through Proverbs chapter 10. Solomon is saying to his son, Rehoboam, who's going to be the next king, look, these are the things you need to be aware of. These are the things that you need to be cautious of. He says, I'm giving you these Proverbs, these wise sayings, to help you understand how to rule the kingdom. When he comes to verse 10, he gives him his first bold warning. He says, my son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. This is a warning. If they say, come with us, lay wait for blood, let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause, let's go out and take advantage of somebody else. He says in verse 12, let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down to the pit. Now, what he's doing is he's including you. He's inviting you in to be part of the people who are going to take advantage of others. That puts you in a superior position. And that's enticing. He's saying, hey, we're going to go get from them. We're going to take advantage of them. We shall find all precious substance we shall fill our house with spoil. Cast in your lot among us. You come. You bring in. You, you can be part of us. Let us all have one purse. Man, there's gang members in Los Angeles. There's gang members probably here in Las Vegas. Gang members in all the large cities that do this day after day after day to weak-minded young people. And they suck them in and say, you're going to be a part of our family. You're going to be part, and there's so, there's so many young people, there's so many people who are, have no family, and it seems enticing. Come, you be part of us. He's, they say, cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, he warns him, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil, and make haste to shed blood. Then he says this, here's the warning, surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird and they lay wait for their own blood. They work privily for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. He says, listen, they're going to tell you to come in, get involved with them. They're going to take advantage of others. Here's what's going to happen. They're going to entrap themselves. And you get involved with them. If they take advantage of you, if they're lying, if they're lying to, to, with you uh, to others, they'll lie about you. If, they, if they're gossiping about you, uh, or gossiping about others to you, they're going to gossip to you. Uh, or they're going to gossip to other people about you. Whatever somebody's doing, 
in an ungodly fashion and asking you to get involved with, listen, you're going to wind up having that same action towards you. Evil doers that do evil to one person is going to wind up doing evil to you. As a teacher, Rob, if a kid comes in and you, into your class and starts complaining about the teacher down the hall, he's going to be complaining to the teacher down the hall about you. Kyle, where you work, if somebody comes in and starts ripping apart the guy on the other side of the store, when he gets a chance, he's going to rip apart you to the guy on the other side of the store. He's saying you need to understand the evil worker is an evil worker. The evil worker does wrong. And if he's doing wrong, Curtis, to, to somebody else in front of you, <laughs> be sure he's going to do something wrong to you. That's just the way it is. Evil workers don't change. They're going to treat, they're going to treat everyone evil because the concept is very simple. It's all about me. It's all about what I'm going to get out of this. So don't be fooled by the guy that says, let me tell you what I did to this guy down the street. Because if he did it to the guy down the street, he's going to do it to you. Beware of evil workers. Beware of those who would treat others wrong. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, look in Proverbs chapter 7. This is also a very great illustration of this. In Proverbs chapter 7, we have a story that I call that I call the stupid boy and the strange woman. You say, why is he a stupid boy? Because the Bible says he's simple-minded. Uh, and, 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 and Solomon tells, is telling his son the story. He says, my son, keep my words, in verse 1, lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live, and, the, and my law is the apple of thy eye. Listen to what I'm saying, he's saying. Catch what I'm saying. Bind them about thy fingers. Write them upon the tables of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding kinsman. What he's saying is this. Listening to your parents, listening to, he's saying specifically to his son, you listening to my instruction is like binding wisdom in your heart. So listen to what I'm saying. That why? That, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger that flattereth with her words. The idea of the strange woman wasn't this. It wasn't a strange <laughs> woman. That's not the idea. The strange woman was a woman that had not been taught the principles of Scripture like the Jewish ladies that were in, in Jerusalem or in Israel. But they were, they were women from another land who conducted themselves and acted like harlots because they hadn't been trained in the, in, 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 the, in the scriptures. And so they came in with strange customs. They dressed in improper, immodest fashion. And, and Israelite boys would watch as these girls came in and say, whoa, I'm taken by a strange woman. This woman from outside is like, dressed to the hilt, and man, he's catching the eyes, and he's saying, beware of that. Don't get led astray. Now, Solomon could speak with this with authority, because he had 800 wives, and uh, he had been taken in by a bunch of strange women in his life, so now he's warning his son, don't, be, don't do the dumb thing that I did. So he says, so, so it gives us a, a story. He says, for at the window of my house, I looked through my casement. So you pictured he's up in this house. He's got this window, and he's looking through the window. He's looking down at the street, all right? He says, I looked through my casement, and behold, among the simple ones. The word simple just means stupid. Okay, I looked all, I saw a bunch of the stupid people down there. I discerned amongst the youth. These were particularly young, stupid people, okay? I considered amongst the youth a young man, void of understanding. The word void means empty. And understanding means knowledge. So he was empty-headed. He, he had no brain. Uh, I discerned amongst these stupid, simple people a young man whose mind obviously was empty of any knowledge. Quite a graphic description. So he's passing through the street near her corner and he went the way of her house. The stupid boy is going by the harlot's house. In the twilight, he's going, how do we know he's stupid? Because he's going that way in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. What a dumb place to put yourself uh, when you know there's a harlot down there. Don't do it. And behold, there met him 
a woman with the attire of a harlot. The word behold is, is, is very, it's like a surprising word. It's like, it's like and he's, he's walking along thinking nothing's going to happen. And shock, shock. It's nighttime, it's twilight, and, and I'm going by the harlot's house, and oh, shock, it's a harlot. Okay, so, so here it is. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot, and subtle of heart, that is, she, she knew how to say the right things. And then he describes this harlot. She is loud, and she's stubborn, and her feet abide not in her house, that is, she's always sneaking off. She is, she is without now in the streets and lieth in every corner. So she caught him. Immediately she's physical. And kissed him. And with an impudent face she said unto him, I have peace offerings with me this day. I have paid my vows. She actually speaking in religious terms. She says, therefore came I forth to meet thee. She lies to him. She didn't come to meet him. She came to meet any guy that would come along. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I found thee. I found you. You were the one I was looking for. You. It's only you. Then she starts talking about inappropriate things. When a girl starts talking to a guy about her bed, that's inappropriate. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry and carved works and with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. What he should have done at that point is said, ah, first of all, he shouldn't have been there and he showed himself stupid for being there. Again, this is the stupid boy and the strange woman. And it's, I have perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes. At that point, he should have been running the opposite direction. Come, he said, she says, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with love. And his thoughts are, wait a minute, where's your dad? Where's, where's Papa? Well, how are we going to do this? For the good man is not home. He's gone on a long journey. This good man, this, this father had, was gone and she was saying, come into my house. Nobody's home. He has taken a bag of money and he'll be and and will come home at the day appointed. I know when he's coming home, it's gonna be safe, it's gonna be okay. Now, here's the deal. Say, why are you bringing this up when you say beware of evil workers? Can I tell you this? She is dishonoring to her father, she's dishonoring to her mother, she's dishonoring to this house, and yet she's saying to this guy, I've got your best interest at heart. Can I tell you this? I've told this to people all over and over again. If, if you're marrying a girl that despises her father and despises her mother, she's going to wind up despising you. If you're, if you're getting involved with somebody who is hateful towards others, you need to understand they will eventually be hateful towards you. Because it's not the problem with the whole world. It's the problem with the evil worker. There was a guy laying on his couch years ago in a farmhouse and he's laying on his couch and a couple of the boys came in and they saw him sleeping. Uncle so-and-so was laying there sleeping and they thought, let's get uncle. Let's get our uncle. They went and they got some Limburger cheese. He had a mustache and they took the Limburger cheese and they put it up in his side of his mustache and it stunk terrible. It stunk horrible put it up there, and then they sat back and they watched. Pretty soon he woke up. He said, what is that smell? What is that smell? And he got up. He said, man, this couch stinks. And he got up and he said, no, no, this living room stinks. And then he walked into the kitchen. He said, this kitchen stinks. And he walked outside to the front porch and he said, no, the whole world stinks. It wasn't the world. It was his, his, his mustache, it was him that was the stinking thing. What we need to understand is this. There are evil workers. Their works stink. And don't let their stink get on you. Don't let it happen. Don't, don't be taken aside by evil workers. If they'll take advantage of others, they'll take advantage 
of you. The young man who treats his parents bad will treat his wife worse. The young lady that has bad mouth her parents to her future husband will bad mouth her husband to others. Be careful of evil workers. Two things. Number one, beware of dogs. Number two, beware of evil workers. And I think next week we'll finish by talking about bewaring of the concision and those that uh, beware of philosophies and that contradict the teachings of Christ. Beware. God tells us, look, there's these things that we need to be cautious of, and as we're walking through this world, we need to beware of these things. Father, help us to be careful. Help us not to um, get involved in things that will hurt us. And I thank you for your warning in Scripture. I thank you you love us enough to give us warning. And I pray you'll help us to take these warnings to heart that we might be what you want us to be. Protect us as we try to serve you. You told us to pray this way, and we do. We pray that your holy name would be manifest in our lives, that your kingdom would come in our lives, that your will would be done in our lives in this earth just like it's done in heaven. We pray you give us this day everything that we need to do your will. Forgive us our sins, Father, as we forgive those that sin against us. Lead us not into trials and deliver us from Satan's attacks. So lead us not into these temptations. Have, keep us wise so that we will not get involved in these things that you tell us to beware of. Lead us not into trials. Deliver us from the evil one. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, let me ask this question. Do you know for sure if you died right now? You'd go to heaven? If you do, would you slip up your hand as a testimony to that? Thank you. You can put your hands down. Maybe you couldn't raise your hand. Maybe you're here and you say, Preacher, I don't know I'm going to heaven. I'd like to know for sure I'm going to heaven, but I don't. Well, listen, there's only one way anybody gets to heaven, and that's by coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. We have to humble ourselves before God. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know that you are God. I know you died to pay for my sins. I believe you were buried and rose from the dead for me. And I want to ask you to give me eternal life. The Bible says it's the only way we can get to heaven. There's no way you're going to get to heaven by good works or baptism or church membership. You have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And you get that by asking him for eternal life. Maybe you've never done that and you'd say, preacher, pray for me. I'd like to do that tonight. I won't embarrass you. I won't have to ask you to come forward. But if you're here... And you say, preacher, I don't know for sure I'm going to heaven, but I'd like to know that. I'd like to pray for you and uh, pray that, that you'll receive Christ tonight. Would you let me pray for you? Anybody like that? Would you slip up your hand? I didn't raise my hand a minute ago, preacher. I don't know for sure I'm going to heaven, but I'd like to know that. Pray for me. Anybody like that at all? Hold it up high enough for me to see. Okay, I see a hand that went up. I'll pray for you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Father, I pray for this one who raised their hand and said, I don't know for sure I'm going to heaven. Thank you for his honesty. And I pray, Father, that before he leaves here, he'll put his faith and trust in you and ask you to give him eternal life. With heads still bowed and eyes still closed, let me say this. You can pray right now. If you'd like to, you raised your hand and said, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. You can pray right now to Jesus Christ where you are. You can say these words to him. Don't just repeat these words because I tell you to repeat them. But you can say these words to Jesus and he'll hear and answer your prayer. Just say to him, whisper these words to him. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that you are God. And I know I'm a sinner. I know I don't deserve to go to heaven. But I believe you died to pay for my sin. I also believe you rose from the dead, proving you are God. And right now, in the best way I know how, I call on you and ask you to be my Lord and my Savior and my God. Thank you, Jesus for dying for me. Help me now to live for you. If you just prayed that and you meant that, 
And you, you're on your way to heaven because you become a child of God by asking him for salvation. We'd like to help you grow in that. Christian, ask God to help you. Be cautious about these things. And beware of these things. Beware of evil workers. Beware of getting sidetracked when it comes to witnessing. Just share the gospel with those who want to hear it. Father, I thank you for your word, and I pray you'll use what has been said for your glory and your honor. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Isn't God good? Can you say amen? amen. All right, that's it. Thank you for coming. Uh, and that's it. I don't sing or dance. I just, it's all over. God bless you. Have a good night. <laughs>